Well, I've been telling you on June 2nd, I would give you an update on our freedom campaign and tell you where we're at. So I don't know if you've been as excited about this as I have, but um, yesterday after getting off the phone with somebody, as of yesterday afternoon, we've been trying to raise money to pay off our existing mortgage, which is about 1.15. And if there's funds to do some remodeling of our current and any, any money left over would be seed money. Well, you all, well, no, we all, because we're in this together, right? have pledged $823,000, $845.63. Woo! Isn't that awesome? That's just saying, that's over and above what you're already given sacrificially. Over 75 pledges and then countless one-time gifts. And some of you told me, you don't give pledges, you'll just give as the Lord gives. God bless you. You know, this is all a gift from His Spirit. So some statistics, this will pay off 90% of our remaining mortgage. At the end of this three years, when all, this funds, all these funds come in, we will have saved around $250,000 in interest. Isn't that awesome? Over 70% of our remaining interest will have been paid off in three years because of your faithfulness. I, uh, as I told you last week, I was almost in tears last Sunday. As I ch- kind of see the cards come in, I've just been praying over each one of them, and um, There's not one that comes in that isn't from a deep place of um, generosity from within you. So I just want to say thank you. Um, And I also want to tell you something a little harder. Gird your loins. Because if we believe this is a movement of God, and that God inspired this, then surely the gates of hell are going to press against this. The day after I, I submitted our form... I had an unexpected uh, dental emergency, and they showed me the bill, and I thought, of course. But this is from God. And as we sang earlier, we know no force of hell can stand against the work of God. I have no doubt that there's going to be pressure. Bills are going to come in. First service, as I'm talking about this, the lights shut off. Like, oh dear God, we should pray, right? (laughs) Like, I have no doubt that, you know, life's going to happen. But these, as, as we filled out our card, we remember this isn't a gift because we have abundance sitting around, right? These are gifts of faith. I have no idea what tomorrow is going to hold for your life, for my life, or three years from down the road. But I'm going to trust God. If he's the one who called me into this amount, God's going to figure it out. Or he's going to be gracious along the way. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for coming alongside grab each other by the arm on this journey because we're going to need each other. Remember these words from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off, get free from any hindrance or sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. God, we commit all this to you because this is your church. I'm humbled, truly humbled by the sacrificial gifts of your servants. I just think $823,000 could have been spent on a lot of other places in the next three years, but your people have said it's worth it to get free God, you are so good. You are so faithful. Your people are so kind and so generous. Who am I and what is my family that you have brought us this far by faith? See us through, Holy Spirit. May we join together when we need it the most and honor you with all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, this is the last sermon of this series. Next week, we're starting a series on the book of Acts. Just to clarify, one asked me, is that A-X-E? Like, no, that would be like a whole different HBO series. Uh, This is A-C-T-S. It's the, uh, what, fifth book in the New Testament. And there is a daily reading guide on the hospitality desk that starts tomorrow. So you really, you read two chapters a week, and you kind of pull it apart bit by bit every day. And then on Sundays, we will share a sermon out of those two chapters that we'll read. My kids have signed up for doing this. Uh, One of them is in the middle of adolescence, and I'm learning 
about what I was like when I was a teenager by watching him, I'm sure. And so some of those at typical adolescent things are coming up, like that, that quest for independence. You know what that looks like? I remember when I was a kid, I just couldn't wait to be an adult, right? I wanted to be an adult, and what that meant was I want to stay up as late as I want. They have no idea that adults, we just want to go to bed, right? <laughs> and I want, I want to be an adult because I want to eat whatever I want. I want to make my own rules. I don't want to have to live by somebody else's rules. Essentially, we just want to be free, right? We just want to be free. Sometimes we translate that definition of adulthood to what it means to be an adult out of the grave, to be an adult in Christ, to mature in Christ. I just have a couple words for us today. We're going to watch an amazing testimony and then share in communion. But I want, what I want to say is when we adult in Christ, it's a movement from being a disciple to being a servant to being a friend of God. John chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus says, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. So just imagine these disciples are walking by Jesus and Jesus sees them and calls them to follow him, to be his disciple. And so He's calling them to come alongside him, to learn from him, and to become like him. And Jesus was the one who chose them. This scripture that was read to us earlier, John 15, 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So when we begin this life of faith, we begin in this discipleship stage where we're just so flippin' excited that God chose us. I can't believe he loves us. I can't believe he has mercy for me. I can't believe I get a new start with Jesus. But to be a disciple means you want to become like the one who's discipling you. So the goal of a disciple is to become like Jesus. So if I may say, to be an adult in Christ is to become like Jesus. And he's called holy. So being an adult, the purest definition, because if you know Jesus, is to become holy. It's synonymous with being an adult. Well, I don't often feel like that, right? Am I alone in the room? But God says that's the goal. That's the primary trajectory of your life is to become like me. And then there's this other part of faith, and you can see it when you first start out, you just want to absorb everything. I just want to receive everything. I want to come to Bible studies. I want to come to worship. I'm going to come to every grow that's out there. I'm going to go to every vision kitchen and serve because I just need fed. But then there's a shift that happens sometimes where you're like, I'm ready to give back. And so you start serving. Right? We talked two weeks ago about our purpose. When you realize your purpose is to be an ambassador of Christ, you're like, let me get my hands dirty. So we got this rummage sale this week. We had a fundraiser dinner for Haiti last week. Yesterday, a group from our church built a ramp for a young man in Perrysburg. Teens are signed up for both mission trips. People are serving at Perrysburg Christian United every week because they realize it's not just about receiving, it's about giving back. And there's these phases that you go through. If I can talk to, our, a teen, talk to and about our teens for a second. At the dinners last fall, when I sat around and asked people what, what you love, if you could do anything for the church or vision you had for the church, over and over this came up. When our teens graduate, they don't come back. And they weren't talking about to the church. Well, statistics show 50% of very committed teenagers in youth group, when they go to college, 50% of them walk away from their faith. And most don't come back. Isn't that sobering? When you see the list in the bulletin? <sighs> but yet they're disciples and they're servants. Some, some we baptized and then we confirmed. And, and yet, what happens 
Well, they're independent and they make their own decisions. All that's true, but I also think, and there's some research out there as to why some of this may be. Here's some ideas. One, I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we're guilty as adults of saying things like this. It's what happens in college. They need to go find themselves. Right? And in our desire to have our children become independent, which is a good goal, we often assume that the way they're going to get there is through walking away from their faith. I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if I tell my kid you're going to screw up, they're probably going to screw up. Secondly, churches, not this church in particular, but churches globally, and as a youth pastor, I was guilty of this. We focus so much on separate youth and children's ministry that once they got out of those areas, they didn't know how to integrate with the life of the whole church. That is the number one factor, they say, in helping our college kids retain their faith, is that they're still connected intergenerationally. The most important thing, they say, to help them hold their faith is to be intergenerationally connected. So when Kevin asked about prayer partners for college, oh my goodness, he should have a list as long as the day ends, right? Because they need to know that we're still here, that this is still their church. Number three, we've placed the American dream higher than the dream of them becoming like Christ. And I've been guilty as I started thinking, I got four years till my oldest graduates. I don't know what he's going to do after that, but I started thinking about what do I believe about college? And I realized college is not the goal. Graduating college is not the goal. It's helping him become like Jesus. So then I ask, okay, how does college time fit in? Right? It's secondary. Yes, I want him to be a productive member of this society, but I believe he's going to do that best when he finds his purpose in Jesus. Right? That's the goal. So how does this college time fit in? And here's the last one. Teens, college, soon-to-be kids, workforce, military, everybody. We usually drift into complacency. It's not usually like, you know what, I'm out of here, I'm turning my back on it and going. Usually it just happens. You get connected with somebody, you get connected with somebody, or you're just away. You don't have routines like you've used to have. You don't have the same structure. Everything's changed, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm just not sure I believe it anymore. You drift into complacency. Friends, the most important thing you can do, those of you who are going to a college campus especially, Within the first week, Tiffany Howard at BG told me within the first two to four days, you need to connect with a campus ministry, or usually you'll never come to a campus ministry event. So more than pledging your Greek place of choice, first connect in a place that's good. If you want to stay connected to Jesus, connect in a place that's going to help you do that. But here's the good news. I deeply believe this doesn't have to be God is bigger than this. His faithfulness is bigger than normal teenage rebellion. He's bigger than that. But I want to let you hear about it from a testimony of someone who has uh, recently and currently walking that road. So whenever you're ready, Kim. So my name is Grace Reddick, and I've grown up in Perrysburg my entire life. And I've gone here, actually, my entire life um, to first service, mostly. But I'm going to graduate from UT in December. Um, And so Dan asked me, or Kevin asked me, I guess, to kind of give my college testimony. And I was like, okay, how long do you want it? And he said five minutes. And I was like, four years and five minutes. (laughs) Let's try to figure this out. (laughs) Um, But so I kind of just chronologically thought through college and just kind of noted the biggest things that God taught me um, through my experience. So I only came up with like five big things, but they're important. At least the big things I learned. Um, So the first thing that I think was the most important thing, actually, was just knowing and walking with Jesus my entire life, um, and especially taking that into college, because um, it was just what I needed to keep me grounded and anchored in college, because college threatens to, like, crush you or throw you into confusion or something. Um, You just have those moments, and so it just kept me anchored spiritually and mentally and emotionally. Um, And Jesus lived a pretty radical and scandalous life when he was on earth. Um, 
if it just meant loving the sinful and the broken. Um, and so it's a perfect example of why it's a relationship with God instead of just a religion. So for me, what I called like Bibling <laughs> in college um, was just an act of surrender um, to God, to give him my chaotic schedule and trust him with my time um, and just to show him that he meant more to me than my grades or my schoolwork or anything. Um, and it wasn't like some religious fulfillment or anything, but it was just personally for me to stay close to God and keep that anchor. Um, and so as part of this walk with God, I've had so many days in college where I've just been completely raw and just straight up ugly with God. But those are honestly some of the sweetest moments I've had in my relationship with God. Um, it's going to sound weird, but it's just like a, like a sweet spiritual fragrance to be that vulnerable and open with God and just to let Him hold you. Um, because for me, my being real with Him gave Him the space that He needed to unleash His love and His grace and His peace on me. So that was the first thing, is just knowing and walking with Jesus and taking that with you into college um, and just throughout life, honestly. The second thing is don't ignore the little voice that you hear. <laughs> um, with time, for me, it's gotten easier to distinguish between what was my own thoughts and what was actually God talking to me. And um, first of all, it's just really cool to sense God talking to you because He just feels a lot closer. But it was His voice that led me to make some pivotal decisions in my life, especially during college. Um, like, for example, I felt his nudging me to go to Ohio State instead of Bluffton and I was really confused at first um, but I realized I was going to be going to Bluffton as a comfort zone thing and so him taking me to Ohio State just got me completely out of my comfort zone and it was just I realized he was teaching me how to just blindly and wholeheartedly trust him with my life. Another thing I noticed or I guess when I sensed his voice was just calling me away from a two-year relationship which was honestly wonderful and I was really confused why I would need to leave it um, but I later realized that he was just being merciful to me because he was sparing me a much later probably much greater hurt um, so I'm just I've always been glad that I followed his voice but I've often regretted following my own <laughs> um, and side note I have never I'm glad that he's made me not really want anything to do with alcohol or parties or anything. So for those of you who are more outgoing, take the little voice with you and be safe. <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, take the voice with you everywhere, but listen to it. Um, third thing I learned, and this was super huge for me, was just to take one day at a time. I think in college you're essentially trained to take the entire semester in one bite, especially during syllabus week when they're throwing all your classes are throwing exam dates and projects and due dates at you and it's super overwhelming and you kind of want to blow your brains out but honestly God did not create us this way um, he specifically rested on the seventh day to teach us to like chill out for a while so do not take it all in one bite honestly for me it I don't get stressed out much in college anymore just because I've reminded myself to um, just to take care of myself, to take frequent mental breaks, um, eat decent meals. And I say decent because ice cream is really good for your feelings. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, take your schoolwork daily, um, take breaks, especially like outside because the oxygen to your head, even just for a few minutes, makes a huge difference. So just be smart about how you go about your schoolwork. I've met so many people who, um, had spent like eight to ten hours in the, a dining hall and they're almost bragging that they were studying the whole time and I'm like you probably didn't remember much ha like after the first half hour so you just wasted your day so just try not to let it overwhelm you just take things one day at a time because that's literally how God designed us to work. Um, the fourth thing is I would say as a general rule follow your head and not your heart. <laughs> we often hear that and I think it's important to realize that your heart often doesn't make great decisions <laughs> and we're always hearing like follow your passions and your dreams and and that's important um, to know yourself and your desires but distinguish between what's like um, for me I had to learn how to 
distinguish between like a good job and then just a hobby. And my mom was super tolerant and patient with me about when I didn't understand what she was talking about and why I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Um, in college, advisors will always tell you to like follow your passions and they'll help you to um, develop a plan to finish that in college. And But honestly, I've met so many more people who like their job. It wasn't necessarily their favorite thing, but they love their job just because they were trained into it, they're good at it. It may not even be their major. I've met a lot of people who have jobs that aren't even their major or didn't even go to college, but they're good at their jobs. Um, and then their passion things are kind of on the side. So for some of you, your passions could be your job and that's fine, but I think for for me, it was just learning that my passions aren't necessarily a wise choice in a job. It's just something I can do on the side. Um, and so I was walking around in college kind of like this, and this was bad because I wasn't being open to other things I might like. So don't do this. And I was sometimes doing this. And then sometimes you'll do this because you're crying. But that's okay, you're allowed to cry. Just don't do this. Because <laughs> I was doing that all the time. And I was getting fussy. Don't do that. <laughs> um, and so, the last thing I would say is keep God at the very core of your life, um, specifically so that you just know who you are in Christ. And that's very important because knowing who I was in God, um, I made a lot of decisions in college that didn't make sense to other people. And a lot of those people were often other brothers and sisters in Christ and so they weren't like they didn't understand my decision sometimes and sometimes I met opposition from them but I realize it's just it's not worth going through that conflict and picking those battles because you know you're doing the right decision um, I knew I was doing the right decision and I knew God was with me so my job was just to love these people and stay confident in who I was in God and um, the things that he had called me to do so I'm sure I've gone over more than five minutes, so I'd like to apologize to Dan. <laughs> it's hard to condense four years into five minutes, but those are the biggest things I took away. So just know Jesus, take him with you, know that he it's a relationship with him and not a religion, and just make those decisions um, with God. And I guess just follow his voice and not your own, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> that's what I've learned. <laughs>